Next uh, speaker of this session is Dr. Scott Roth. Uh, Scott is an associate professor of surgery at the University of Kentucky and chief of mainly invasive surgery. He's going to talk about biologic meshes for eventual hernia repair. Do they work? At the conclusion of uh, Dr. Roth's talk, if all the speakers from this morning could come back up and uh, we'll field questions from the uh, audience. I'd like to start by thanking both uh, Brent and Mike for the opportunity to present today. Uh, it's been an outstanding session so far, and I look forward to the remainder of the session. I do have a few uh, relevant disclosures, but I plan to provide an evidence-based discussion today, um, and I don't think they'll be, um, have any impact on my uh, presentation. So I'd like to start today by uh, discussing the role of biologic mesh in hernia repair. I'm going to review the current biologic mesh materials that are available, discuss some of the alternatives to the utilization of biologic mesh, as well as the outcomes um, at the available human literature as it pertains to biologic mesh for hernia repair. So as you're well aware, ventral hernia repairs are very common, 300,000 per year. It's increasing annually according to the most recent data, and synthetics are, certainly have their problems. Recurrence rates have been reported as low as 5% and as high as 30%. They're contraindicated in infected fields. Um, there's certainly high-risk patients that remain a significant controversy whether they should be utilized because of the proposed or suspicious suspicion for the development of a subsequent mesh infection, as well as the, the known complications that we've heard about and seen today, such as in infections in fistula. What we do know is that synthetic meshes probably aren't the, the be-all, end-all answer. This uh, database from the Washington State demonstrates that mesh hernia repairs actually um, prolong the development of a hernia recurrence by simply pushing the curve to the right but they probably don't actually prevent hernias in the long run. We also know that all the meshes are associated with reduced abdominal wall compliance. If you look at polyester mesh and polypropylene mesh versus controls at 90 days, we can see the abdominal wall compliance with all of these prosthetic materials is reduced compared to a, a primary incisional closure. So they all re result in reduced compliance. When you specifically look at the collagen deposition within the abdominal wall compared to a sham incision, you can see at 90 days, all of these prosthetic materials, whether it be polyester or polypropylene, are, are associated with a reduced amount of collagen 1 relative to collagen 3 in the repair. And you can also see that <coughs> collagenase activity remains active at 90 days afterwards. So these synthetic materials certainly are plagued with problems. This has spawned a, a, a tremendous amount of interest in the component separation hernia repair, um, initially described by Ramirez, but there are many techniques that are currently utilized. And use, uh, utilizing the component separation technique, we can take patients with massive abdominal hernias, uh, loss of domain, and ultimately close their peritoneal cavity um, by uh, obtaining significant advancement. But separation of components, hernia repair is not without recurrence rates and complications. One of the Achilles heels of the separation of components technique is the high incidence of wound complications and wound necrosis, and that's been, a, that's been a reported as high as 50% in, uh, in many series. And recurrence rates are quite variable, but uh, many series reports rates uh, as high as 30%. So can we improve upon these results? And I would argue that we can. We've got a lot of work to do in the realm of hernia repair and uh, there's uh, many opportunities. Biologic mesh represents an opportunity to uh, improve upon our results with what we're doing with either with synthetic mesh or separation of components. Well, what is a biologic mesh? Well, a biologic uh, mesh is a, is a preparation uh, from, a, uh, from a, a live tissue source uh, that's utilized for the repair of a hernia. There are many sources of biologic mesh. They can come from human uh, donor materials. They can come from xenografts. They've been reported to come from pigs, uh, cows, as well as horses. They are sometimes dermis, intestine, uh, pericardium. Many different processing methods are utilized for, um, for uh, procuring these uh, tissues. They're decellularized using a whole host of methods, either physical methods, chemical methods, or enzymatic methods. And then they're all processed and packaged in unique uh, methods. But the goal is the same in all, in all uh, biologic meshes. It's to create an extracellular matrix that's going to rapidly revascularize, infiltrate with host cells, and allow for remodeling and deposition of new collagen, and ultimately for the graft to uh, resorb. In the process of this uh, healing, these grafts either do one of three things. They either incorporate into the abdominal wall and allow for cellular infiltration. They'll encapsulate and become surrounded by connective tissue or resorb. And this, this all happens to various extents at various rates. Uh, Cross-linking is something that we need to discuss. It's a process by which the collagenase sites are, are blocked, 
and it uh, retards degradation in the donor collagen. It's not an all or none phenomenon. It can be manipulated. You can have more or less cross-linking, which affects the characteristics of the material. But as a result, you may have some chronic foreign body type reaction. Um, but the bottom line is cross-linking does preserve the structure, and it's going to last longer, but at the expense of, of, um, of degradation. This is a, a list which I believe is comprehensive, but I may have, I may have missed some of, of the biologic materials that are currently available. The top three represent uh, human biologic materials, and you can see they're all different. Some are packaged uh, prehydrated, some come dehydrated, some are rapidly rehydrated. We have two cross-linked uh, porcine materials that are available. Um, and then there are uh, numerous uh, other materials, fetal bovine dermis, as I mentioned, bovine pericardium, per pericardium as well as a porcine dermis. What are the alternatives to biologic mesh? Well, there are a few, and I think they worth, uh, they're worth discussion. Well, primary uh, closure. In some circumstances, if you have an infected mesh or you have a contaminated case and you feel that you need to do something, uh, primary closure may get you out of a bind, but we know that the likelihood of hernia recurrence is significant and is in excess of 50%. Well, what about massive hernias or loss of domain issues? Well, laparostomy and serial excision, I'll talk about a study with that. Temporary closure systems, synthetic mesh, autologous tissue and flaps, uh, vicro mesh is certainly an option, as well as an unreinforced separation of components. Uh, this is a study actually reported by Dr. Rosen recently looking at serial excision in eight patients. I would argue with six uh, interval operations and a mean, mean hospital stay of 36 days, why well, I can't understand why anyone would even entertain performing such an operation. But it's certainly, it's certainly an option for you. What about, uh, what about the use of synthetic mesh in contaminated wounds? Well, this is a study uh, reported nearly uh, 30 years ago, but I think it's largely true today. When you use a synthetic mesh such as a polypropylene in a contaminated field and leave it open or put a skin graft on it, you are going to have problems. High incidence of EC fistula of 100% uh, when these wounds are left open. Interestingly, in this study, only a small number of patients uh, were treated with full thickness flaps with the addition of a, of a mesh, but there were no problems when a full thickness flap was used in conjunction with a synthet synthetic mesh in a heavily contaminated field. Food for thought. What about flap closures? They work. They're highly morbid. You can see here in this study uh, many options that are available to us, either latissimus rectus, external oblique, TFL, um, and recurrence rates are quite low if you look at, um, at the flap closures, you know, upwards of uh, seven, you know, seven to ten percent has been reported. What about absorbable mesh? It's a great option. It gets you out of a bind, but absorbable mesh is associated with enterocutaneous fistulas as a result of the inflammatory response. The cost of, an, of a uh, enterocutaneous fistula has been uh, postulated anywhere from $100,000 to $250,000. So if one out of 14 patients are uh, developing an EC fistula, um, the cost of that becomes uh, quite significant. Well, do biologic meshes reduce the rate of hernia recurrence compared to separation of components? There is only one study that I've been able to identify in the literature which uh, addresses this question. This study actually looks at, um, at patients that underwent abdominal wall uh, re uh, uh, reconstruction with a human acellular dermal matrix versus those who underwent abdominal wall reconstruction without. And it actually looks at patients who underwent primary closure versus those who are unable to be closed. In this study, the technique for a, a primary closure was a reinforcement, and you can see there's a statistically significant decreased incidence of hernia recurrence, 13 versus 0 percent, when a human acellular dermal matrix, alloderm in this particular study, was utilized as a reinforcement. However, when large hernias uh, in which the fascia was not amenable to primary closure, in this uh, particular uh, study they actually used an underlay of a polypropylene with an overlay of alloderm, there was no statistically significant difference. Um, raising the issue is maybe there is a role for biologic mesh as a conjunction to a separation of components hernia repair. When we do our separation of components with biologic mesh, there are many techniques. Uh, it is quite confusing as what the best technique to utilize is because there are certainly no studies that suggest that an underlay or an overlay or an inlay, although we certainly, we, we now have learned that bridging is uh, not acceptable and we'll talk about that later, but there's little to support our, our techniques. So do all biologic meshes perform equivalently? And I'd like, to I'd like to review the literature as it pertains to humans with a few anecdotal um, uh, animal studies interjected to help, um, help you better understand what we should be doing and why we do it with biologic meshes. If you start with, the, with uh, s uh, small bowel sub uh, submucosa uh, from the intestine, early on, 2002, we were very excited. This is one of the first biologic meshes to, to market. And this study demonstrates 25 patients, gross, uh, grossly contaminated or potentially contaminated, no recurrences in 15 months. So very exciting. At the time, this was very innovative and everyone uh, thought this was the answer. And we saw, but we uh, later learned that uh, this is uh, prone to recurrences um, as high as 30% and significant wound complications related to the use of this material. 
This more recent study looking at uh, SIS mesh has demonstrated in looking at clean, clean contaminated, or dirty wounds, you can see the likelihood of developing complications and recurrences is significantly higher when utilized in these, in these fields. And when you marry uh, a dirty wound with a, uh, with a patient uh, who's critically ill, you can see the likelihood of requiring reoperation or developing hernia recurrences is quite significant, and this has largely fallen out of favor. But what about the crosslink materials? The reason I, I, I uh, highlight this animal study is to, is to note the advantage of a, of a, of a crosslink graft is that it tends to maintain its strength over prolonged periods of time. You can see the, the tensile strength of the graft at implantation at three months and six months, and it's relatively static. So that is one of the advantages of a crosslink graft. This study evaluating seven patients in a prospective fashion uh, for hernia repair in a contaminated field demonstrated no recurrences, very small numbers, follow up only 11 months. Another retrospective study of nine patients in an affected abdominal wall field with a year and a half follow-up demonstrated only one recurrence, and that was a result of an intentional uh, excision of the graft. A prospective study looking at 20 patients, some for hernias, some for acute abdominal wall defects, use, utilizing a cross-linked dermal graft as an underlay interposition demonstrated the overall recurrence rate of 15%. However, when you look at the data more closely, you can see that uh, when it's used for a chronic hernia, a non-infected hernia, 8% recurrence rate, but when it's used for acute abdominal wall defects, the recurrence rate is uh, significantly higher. But the crosslink materials have been associated with more of an inflammatory response, and that certainly is, it warrants um, uh, note, but uh, human, human studies certainly haven't supported this to this uh, present time. But what about the allografts? There's several all uh, allografts that I mentioned. Uh, they're processed differently. Uh, they have minimum screening donor requirements as regulated by the FDA. Patients are screened for infections. Um, early on, we were very excited. Alloderm was the answer. This was great stuff. Uh, 46 patients retrospectively, retrospectively reviewed. If you can see in this early study, numerous techniques were utilized. We didn't know what to do with this stuff. Do we use it as an underlay? Do we use it as an inlay? Do we use it in conjunction with another material? Can you use it with Vicryl? Do you need to use two layers? But a follow-up of about six months demonstrated the recurrence rate of 12%. But what we began to see, uh, we, we then began to utilize this in infected fields, in high-risk patients, active abdominal wall fist, uh, infections, uh, patients with endocutaneous fistulas, tenuous skin, skin coverage. And what we found is that the, uh, it performed well. Again, short follow-up of about six months, but what we learned is that when it's used as an interface, as an inlay, the, uh, the recurrence rate is much higher. So 10% of all recurrences were uh, in this study, and uh, more highly associated with the use of an inlay. And obviously we recognize that we can't use uh, biologic materials as an inlay, uh, much like we can't use synthetic materials as an inlay. So do we use these biologic grafts like synthetic mesh or do we not? Well, in this study, they utilize the graft like a prosthetic patch sewn under minimal, minimal tension. Well, when it's used like a, like a synthetic mesh without tension, we can see that the recurrence rates are quite high. We know that these materials tend to stretch over time. Do they all stretch the same? No, they don't. Um, and that represents uh, some of the differences from some of the different processing uh, techniques that are utilized. Additionally, when the skin is left open, the recurrence rates may be higher. You can see in this study, uh, recurrence rates are, are nearly 50% higher when, the, when a wound is left open as opposed to primary closure. Uh, uh, this study uh, highlights uh, the, the increased incidence of hernia recurrence associated with a bridging repair, um, which we've learned. Uh, and this, uh, this uh, picture from a, a, a porcine study demonstrates what we see clinically with, uh, with the utilization of, of uh, alloderm. You can actually see the stretching and attenuation of the abdominal wall compared to a, 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 a different graph of Veritas. What about uh, human acellular dermal matrices for the open abdomen? What we've learned, again, in the, in the standpoint of bridging, when they're utilizing this technique, over time, all of them develop clinical failures. They develop laxities, they develop recurrent hernias, and as a result, um, probably should not be utilized uh, in that fashion. Well, what about as a bridge? As I mentioned, I think there is an opportunity to uh, utilize uh, biologic materials as a reinforcement to separation of components. You can see in this uh, comparative study, which is retrospective, when, when uh, separation of components is utilized with the human acellular dermal matrix, there's uh, a recurrence rate of about 8% versus, versus bridging repairs have a nearly 60% uh, failure rate. There are some risk factors that are associated with the recurrence, with recurrences when utilizing human acellular dermal matrices. These make sense, they're common sense. As I mentioned uh, several times, interposition is certainly associated with an increased incidence of, uh, of hernia recurrence. Implant size, well this is probably a surrogate for hernia defect size. The larger the defect, the larger number of grafts, the less likely to close the defect primarily, 
probably is going to increase the likelihood of, uh, of hernia recurrence. The number of, of uh, graft sizes, I think this is interesting. If we start sewing sheaths together, does it function as well as one large graft together? Hard to know, um, but I have to believe that um, sewing multiple sheets together is probably less than ideal. And as we know with, uh, with, with laparotomy or other incisional hernias, we know that uh, the presence of an infection is likely to inc increase the likelihood of developing a hernia recurrence. There are new frontiers in biologic mesh, faux biologic mesh as I like to refer them. BioA, it's not a biologic mesh, but maybe it, it functions like a biologic mesh. It allows for tissue ingrowth and incorporation. It's utilized for reinforcement. Serous scaffold, it's a multi-filament bioengineered silk mesh. It's currently being utilized for ACL reconstruction. Same principle, using an off-the-shelf preparation that doesn't require direct um, tissue uh, procurement may be the answer in the future. And I think this is, these are exciting technologies and many, many prosthetics like this are in development uh, today. So in summary, I think it, the take home is that there are numerous biologic meshes available. Are they all the same? No, they're not. They're very different. Um, they certainly have limitations. We should avoid bridging whenever possible. We should consider other options when we're utilizing biologic meshes because of the expense associated with them. Uh, but the bottom line is we need to, we need to accrue more data. Published uh, prospective uh, series in this uh, area are, are highly lacking, lacking and um, we need to accrue more data. Thank you very much.